Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly wrap up of the things I've finished in the past seven days. I only have four things to talk about today. One of them was a reread and one of them I'm going to talk about in a separate review. So I may actually be able to keep this one short. <laughs> So first up, I have Penrix Fox by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is the third Penrick and Desdemona novella in chronological order. It's the fifth one published though. And I reread this one by listening to it on audiobook. In this one, um, Penrick, who is a sorcerer, his friend Inglis, who is a shaman, and Oswell, who is a locator, or essentially this world's version of a police detective, um, are investigating the very strange murder of a sorceress who apparently had no enemies, but somebody shot her in the forest and her demon, which is what gave her sorceress abilities, is missing. And they really need to find it. Um, it was good. I think um, I, I liked Penrick's interactions with Inglis and Oswell a lot here. That's what kind of makes the story work for me is basically at this point Penrick is um, older, a bit more experienced, and I think he's a bit more confident in like following his own instincts and just some of the things he says and does. His, his relationship with his demon, Desdemona, takes a lot of people by surprise, and I always get a particular thrill when he just confounds Oswell, because Oswell has one of those personalities, you know. Anyway, um, I'm not sure that makes much sense if you haven't read uh, the novellas, but it was quite good. I'm really glad I'm rereading these. I've got three more to go, so I'm halfway through. Next up is Monstrous Volume 3, Haven, which is written by Marjorie Liu, and the beautiful artwork is by Sana Takeda. I don't have much to say about this one, to be honest. Um, this is one of the most dense, complex comic series I've ever read. Um, there's so much to unpack, and it's a little bit difficult sometimes to comprehend everything that's going on. Um, and I haven't reread the first two volumes and it's been a while since I read them. But uh, this mainly follows Micah Halfwolf, who is a young woman. I think she's actually an Arcanic, so she's like human demon hybrid or something. Um, and she is unfortunately, against her will, possessed by some sort of ancient demon god thing. And because of her lineage, and the fact she's got this thing inside of her. Uh, she has abilities or is a key to certain things that are very important in um, the impending like second war between humans and Arcanics. This is, th it just has such lush and complex world building and so much is going on that's not explicitly explained all the time. I'm not sure that I can really tell you what I got out of it other than I really enjoyed it and I need to reread the first three volumes before I get to the fourth one. So yeah, I love it and even if it wasn't a good story, the artwork is just so, so good. Um, this is the kind of artwork that I really like. Next up is Lavandis by Robert Holdstock, and this is the one that I'm going to do a separate video on. I really enjoyed this. Um, it's the kind of sequel to Mythago Wood, and where I was kind of tepid about the characters and storyline in the first book, but really liked the idea of the mythic magical wood in the story. Um, the second one was so, so much better in all respects for me, and yeah, I'll have more to say about this in a couple of days. And lastly, I have Traitor's Moon by Lynn Fuelling, which is the third book in the Nightrunner series. I wish I could say I liked this more than I actually did. Uh, so for those of you who have been very excited that I've been reading this series, that I've gotten back to it, I'm sorry if this disappoints you, but um, I was frankly quite bored and a little bit fed up with some of the stuff in this book. Wait, a lot of the stuff in this book because <laughs> it's quite long and like the first 300 pages just felt like really boring predictable info dumping about a culture and a country that was kind of cliche. Um, so the two main characters are Alec and Saragil who are night runners. They're basically 
rogues who work for their adopted kingdom of Scala. Um, and they have gone on a diplomatic mission from Scala to Oranen to ask for Oranen's assistance in a war that Scala is not doing very well in. Um, basically, um, the Oren Fei are the fairy elvish species in this world. They have magic. And Scala um, needs magic. Um, there are not many people with good, strong magical ability anymore because um, Oranen has had like this, this decree of separation. They're, they become an isolationist state, essentially, and there isn't as much intermarrying, interbreeding between the Oren Fei and humans. So fewer wizards. Uh, so they go to Oranen asking for, you know, your basic assistance during wartime, but also like, can you help us out with the magic thing? So a lot of this is court intrigue, political intrigue, and I'm usually really into that. But this just was kind of boring mainly because I thought Oranen and the Oren Fae were really boring and I didn't like them very much and Sarah Gill spends a lot of time explaining things to Alec and kind of being stoically mopey about returning to the kingdom he's been exiled from and everybody's been really mean to him and I get that that's really hard but Sarah Gill just does not behave like himself he feels like he's a completely different person from the kind of badass rogue that he was in the first two books, and I wanted the old Sarah Gill back. But yeah, this is probably the, what is it, the double-edged sword of cliché traditional fantasy. Um, you realize that cliché and traditional kind of mean the same thing. We tend to say cliché with a negative connotation, but traditional means the same thing, but with like positive connotations. Um, <laughs> they're both about conventions and possibly overused conventions. A lot of this series is conventional. There are unconventional things like the fact that the two protagonists are in a gay relationship um, and the role of women in um, the world as well. But when it comes down to, you know, how the world actually works and the Oren Fey and magic and all of that, it's really cliche. It's traditional fantasy. And for the most part with the series, I found that to be fun and comfortable and kind of like cozy fantasy reading. But in this book, probably because it was slow and a bit too long, I kind of ran out of patience with it. And I just wanted to cut all that out and get something more original. Um, the other thing that started to bother me a lot um, and tell me if I'm reading way too much into this, but it's just something I noticed and I couldn't stop noticing it. Um, so Alec and Saragil at this point have been in a committed romantic sexual relationship for two years. In the beginning of the book, there's even a, a whole bit where the author has written that they've had hot, hot sex on like every possible surface in the house they've been living in for the last two years. And then they're referred to as friends. That's not the word. <laughs> I think they're a bit more than friends. When they're talking to each other or about each other, they do not call each other friends. They call each other Tali, which is kind of, you know, the word for my dear, my love, my lover or whatever. Um, it's a very affectionate term. But you notice that when they're talking to each other and saying that, they're saying it in a foreign made up language and not in English. When they're just being described, it's their friends. And this is said repeatedly. They'll do something that's like, oh, they're about to have sex. They're in love. They feel strongly for each other. They have an almost magical bond. That means they can practically feel each other's emotions, but we're gonna call them friends. And then I started noticing that whenever Alec and Saragil have like a romantic intimate scene, they kiss and then it fades to black. 
There's a straight couple here. Um, Becca meets an Oren Faye man and they very rapidly develop feelings for each other and then they're boinking and all of a sudden we have got a scene where they don't just kiss and fade to black. No, no, they get the extended scene of taking their clothes off and touching each other and then we get the pillow talk afterwards and it just struck me that the gay relationship is not really being written in the same way as the straight relationships. And I feel like there's like this weird cognitive dissonance going on there, which is not um, internal world building. It's more on the author's side. And I don't usually like to try to assume or interpret what's going on with the author through their fiction. I feel like that's kind of shaky ground. Don't go there. But in this case, I really wondered what was going on with the way that Flueling was writing this. Like, why are you choosing these particular words? Why are you describing your secondary character's relationship in much more graphic detail than you are your protagonist's relationship. That's a bit odd. Anyway, all of these things combined to make this kind of a slog for me, and I didn't, I don't really love it that much. It wasn't bad, I just thought it was okay. Um, I will be continuing on with the series. I did not realize until I was looking at publication dates that this is kind of like, a first trilogy and a second trilogy. Uh, Trader's Moon was published in 1999, and the fourth book after this was published almost a decade later in 2008. And frankly, I'm really curious about whether the intervening time and different, you know, social context uh, will make the way the relationship is written in the next book at all different, because it very possibly could. So that is what I read this past week. Let me know if you have any thoughts on these books as well. Maybe leave me a comment down below. I'll be back to talk to you again soon. And until then, bye.